Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Plant Viruses, Everywhere and Often Mutualistic. I'm Christina Jewell of Labroots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented and sponsored by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, please visit www.labroots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit these questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, Please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of the web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Marilyn Rusink, PhD. Marilyn Rusink is Professor of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology and Biology at the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics at Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Rusink received a PhD in 1986 from the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Microbiology and Immunology, studying hepatitis B virus on the National Institutes of Health Fellowship. Following a postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell University, where she began studying plant viruses, she moved to the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation as a principal investigator and focused her research on plant virus evolution and ecology. After the discovery of a novel plant fungus virus, three-way mutualistic symbiosis that allows plants to grow in geothermal soils in Yellowstone National Park, her interest expanded to include viruses of fungi. Currently, she's a member of the Center of Infectious Disease Dynamics and a professor of virus ecology in the Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology at the Pennsylvania State University. She and her team have been studying virus ecology and experimental evolution for 25 years using plant and fungal viruses as models and have published a number of seminal papers in this area. She is an expert in virus diversity and biodiversity and has done extensive work on complex interactions between beneficial viruses and their hosts that are involved in adaptation of plants and fungi to extreme environments. I will now turn it over to Marilyn for her presentation. Dr. Rusick? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm just going to start right off with my slides. And um, I want to acknowledge some people that are on the first slide here. So the title of the talk is Plant Viruses Everywhere and Often Mutualistic. And I want to acknowledge Zhao Dong Bao, Luis Marquez, Prasenjit Saha, and Ping Xu, who are, um, have been very instrumental in this work. And some of the work I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to give you kind of a 10-year time span on this. So some of it started at the Noble Foundation, where I used to be, and then we continued it here at Penn State. So I want to introduce the topic of virus ecology, first of all. Um, because most of us who are virologists kind of grew up with a reductionist viewpoint of molecular virology um, and that involves a lot of experimental work and it's been very important and it's taught us a lot about viruses. But most of this has focused on human related viruses which means viruses in humans and in domestic animals and plants. Um, but now as I've gotten older in my career I've decided to take a broader picture and so one of the things we've been doing is looking at viruses in wild hosts. And also we look at how viruses really affect the interaction between the host and the larger environment. So we've backed away from this reductionist viewpoint to try to see what's really going on in the real world and the real environment. 
So I also want to introduce you to this concept of viruses as symbionts. Um, we, in our lab, we use the classic definition of symbiosis, which was coined in the 19th century. And it was basically people working on lichen. And they discovered lichen, they discovered two uh, dissimilar entities, an algae and a fungus, that were living together in a symbiotic relationship. And that's essentially the definition. Two or more dissimilar entities living in or on one another in an intimate relationship. So if you are a symbiont, you have different lifestyle choices. You can be mutualistic, and people often confuse mutualism with symbiosis, but that's just one kind of symbiosis. So symbiosis can also be commensal or antagonistic. So it does not mean mutualism. Antagonistic, commensal, and mutualistic symbioses are on something of a continuum also. So Entities that are symbiotic can move around this. Sometimes they may be mutualistic. Sometimes they may be commensal. That can depend on the environment. So antagonistic symbiosis means that the symbiosis is detrimental to one partner while the other is benefited. And this includes most of the viruses you heard about. These are the viruses that cause disease in humans and in livestock and plants and wildlife. Um, and these are very well studied. But in fact, these interactions are probably not very common when we look at the big world of virology. So commensal symbiosis is when the relationship is neutral for one or both partners. And this is probably the most common virus-host interaction. Mutualistic, <coughs> excuse me, mutualistic symbiosis is when the relationship is beneficial for all the partners. And I should point out here that symbiosis doesn't mean just two partners. It can be more than two. And there are many examples of these mutualistic symbiosis relationships in viruses, but they are very poorly studied. So um, some of these relationships are obligate. That means that the virus is required for the survival of its host. And some are conditional. So depending on the conditions, um, the virus may or may not be required. And I'll talk about both of those kinds, some examples from my lab. So I mentioned that there is this um, mutualistic antagonistic continuum and that things can fall anywhere on this. So on this slide, on the left side, you have a plant that's perhaps infected with a mutualistic virus, and it looks very vigorous. And you have the antagonistic virus on the right side. But they can actually fall anywhere in between, and they can move, as I said, along that continuum. So um, symbiosis may occur at many different levels of complexity between a virus and its host, and also among viruses in mixed infections. Um, and then we also look at symbiosis that occurs be among viruses and their hosts, and then their host's hosts. So we look at fungi, which are often um, actually symbionts of plants. So we look at plants that are colonized by fungi that are in turn infected with viruses. So why is it important to talk about symbiosis? Well, for one thing, it really stresses the relationships, not just the details of the individuals, but how they relate and interact with each other. And it gives us a, a nice framework to look at non-pathogenic or non-antagonistic lifestyles. It can also um, affect our evolutionary model. So most people are familiar with Darwinian evolution, which is where like entities compete and evolve gradually through natural selection. And this is a very powerful force. However, it's not necessarily the only force in the evolution of life. Symbiotic entities must cooperate. So when Darwin was developing his theory, there, symbiosis wasn't even known. And when, what people, when people recognized it, they just thought it was some odd, bizarre thing and not common. And so it was never really taken into account in Darwin's work. Um, and finally, symbiosis is also important because it leads to symbiogenesis which is speciation through fusion. And there's been a lot of that in virus-host interactions, too, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So we work on the viruses of plants and fungi. And all wild plants are colonized by fungal and bacterial symbionts, even probably most of the plants in your garden or your yard. Um, in agriculture, we do things to try to get rid of fungi and bacteria. Uh, but in nature, the plants are almost always colonized by these microbes. And, and these microbes also harbor viruses. So my lab studies these viruses of plants and their endophytes. And 
And um, one of the reasons we've chosen this system is because it's a nice system to work in. Plants are easy to grow, they're inexpensive, and you can get a lot of genetically identical organisms in your greenhouse and do actually reproducible experiments. So I'd like to move on to some work we've done in the lab, and I'm going to talk a bit about plants and how they adapt to extreme environments. So this picture is uh, of Yellowstone National Park. This is taken in the winter, so you can see the steam rising off of some of the hot springs. And if you've been there, you may have seen a scene that looks like this. And what we have here is an area where all the plants are dead, or most of them anyway. And that's because these geothermal features that make up all the amazing things we see in Yellowstone are actually not very stable. They move around a lot. Most of the ones that you've seen as a tourist are the most stable ones. They don't really like tourists to go into the unstable area because it's quite dangerous. But you may see something that looks like this. And this is not because of a forest fire, but because a geothermal feature moved. So for plants to survive, they have to adapt very rapidly. And most plants don't really survive very high temperatures. Um, vascular plants have one of the lower upper limits of temperature of any life form. But in Yellowstone, you can find this plant growing in geothermal soils. And this is growing here above 50 degrees centigrade, so the temperatures are in centigrade. And this plant is called Dicanthelium lanuginosum, or hot springs panic grass. And if this plant is colonized by a fungus. So the way that this study was done, this was done by colleagues of mine, and they um, brought the plants into the laboratory, they surface sterilized them, and then they plated them on fungal growth media. And what happens is this fungus grows out of this um, surface sterilized plant. So this is a fungal endophyte. It is living inside the plant. This fungus happened to be curvularia protuberata. And what we see when we take plants from an extreme environment is that they usually just have one or very few different fungi in them. If you take a plant from a relatively normal environment, you will probably see lots of different kinds of fungi growing out of it. But if it's in an extreme environment, it usually just has one or very few. So Curbularia protuberata is a filamentous fungus. It has these spores that are curved with a little protuberance. That's where the name comes from, Curbularia protuberata. And it's one of the few Latin names that makes sense to me because it's actually named to describe the appearance of the, of the spores. So this was an experiment that was done more than 10 years ago by my colleagues who, were start, who originally started this study. And they grew the plants, um, the dicanthelia plants, in the, in the laboratory. The S on this slide stands for symbiotic, and the NS stands for non-symbiotic. So the symbiotic plants did just fine at 50 degrees and even at 65 degrees of soil temperature, whereas the non-symbiotic plants didn't do so well. <clears throat> and at 65 degrees, they all died. So this is where I got involved in this study. I, was, I had been studying virus populations of plant viruses for quite a while, and I was interested in looking at viruses that, were, that had a persistent lifestyle. That means that they stayed in a single host for very long periods of time, many generations. So I asked my friends um, and colleagues if they could send me their collection of fungal isolates, and they did. So I looked at them um, for viruses. And the way that we look for viruses and fungi, the simplest way is to look for double-stranded RNA. That's a hallmark feature of a virus. And this is a gel showing double-stranded RNA that was extracted from a number of different isolates from Yellowstone. And you can see there are two bands where the arrow is. There are two bands that showed up in all of these isolates. There were some other things, too, but those two were really consistent. And when we looked at the same fungus, Curvularia, but from other plants, for example, strawberry shown here, this um, plant does not grow in the geothermal areas, but it's still colonized with Curvularia. It turns out that there's no um, virus in that. So that seemed really interesting to me, and I wondered if the virus was involved at all in this whole process. So. Well, first we did, what we did was characterize the virus. It's easy to characterize the virus. If you're a virologist, we knew how to do that. So we looked at it in the electron microscope. It's a small icosahedral virus. It has um, two double-stranded RNAs. We sequenced those. This was um, before a lot of the next generation sequencing was available, um, but still not too hard to sequence a viral genome. And we found that it encoded five open reading frames. This is the um, genome organization as shown here. 
We know now that open reading frame 1 and 1A and 1B um, may be expressed as a fusion protein and in other isolates of this virus, they, it is a single open reading frame. The 2A open reading frame is the coat protein and we don't know what the other open reading frames do. Okay, so of course the question was, is the virus involved in thermal tolerance? So in order to look at that, um, the first thing we had to do was try to get rid of the virus, secure the fungus of the virus, and that's actually quite difficult to do. These are persistent viruses for a reason, the name is for a reason, they are very persistent. But eventually we succeeded, it was really an accident, um, which is how some of the best science gets done. So anyway, eventually we got a virus-free isolate of the fungus, and then we introduced an antibiotic marker into it so that we could track it. So we had this antibiotic, or this virus-free fungus containing um, a marker for hygromycin. And then we reintroduced the virus into that fungus. And that we did um, through a process called anastomosis, where you grow the, fun the two different strains of fungi in a petri dish, and where they come, where they meet, you get things exchanged like viruses. So in the end, we had three different strains of the virus. We had the wild type, which was the original one from Yellowstone. Then we had the virus-free, where we had cured it. And then we had what we called AN, where the fungus um, reacquired the virus through this process of anastomosis. So here's the experiment that we did. Um, we, in, we colonized the plants with the wild type fungus, with the, with the fungus containing the anastomosed um, virus with the virus-free fungus, and then we had non-symbiotic plants. So whenever we had the virus that is in the wild type and the anastomosed fungus, then the plants survived these high soil temperatures. These were done at uh, 55 degrees. So they survived the high soil temperatures just fine. And when we didn't have the virus, that means we had the virus-free fungus. So the fungus was still there, but no virus. Those plants behaved just like the ones that had no fungus at all and they essentially they all died. All right, so we've been doing a little more ecology in this system now in more recent times. And this is a, a map of the geothermal areas of Yellowstone National Park. And you may recognize some of these if you visited Yellowstone. Um, some of them are places that you go to, like a Norris Geyser Basin, Mammoth Hot Springs. These are places that people um, have liked to visit and they're a really spectacular thing to see too. But if you were, want to do research in Yellowstone, then you can't really do research in these popular tourist sites. They prefer, the park prefers, that no one sees you collecting samples. So um, they like you to go far away from where the tourists are. And these are the areas that we collected samples in. So we had five locations here. Amphitheater Springs, which is where we um, got the original isolate. Then Nymph Creek, 100 Springs, Rabbit Creek, and Firehole. And with next to these locations that are listed here, you can see how many samples we took. Not very many. And the reason we don't take very many samples is that these are very fragile environments. So we don't want to kill all the plants that are there by taking them. So we just take a very few, kind of a minimum number to see whether we can figure out what's going on with the ecology of the system. So at the amphitheater location, we also collected a number of different plant hosts. Um, so there, we collected both the original panic grass, Dicampelium linuginosum, and then we also collected strawberry, which is Fregaria. We collected cotton batting and bent grass, another uh, monocot. Um, so we looked at all of these as well. Well, this is, um, they all had endophytes in them. Basically, uh, they all had curvularia in them. And this is a phylogenetic analysis of the endophyte host that we collected from those sites. And um, this is a maximum likelihood tree. We used elongation factor 1 alpha. We've used a few other uh, marker genes as well. And they, the phylogeny holds up very well. So it turns out this large group, their larger clade here is Curvularia protuberata. And then we found a second um, species of curvularia. It looks more like inequalis than any other species, but we actually think it's a probably a new species. So this is um, overlaying this with the locations of where we collected these. And, and the point of this slide is really to say that there isn't any geographic structure in the phylogeny of the fungal endophytes. So 
there from all over, um, from all of the various places where we collected. We have more from Amphitheater Springs just because we collected a lot more from that site. Um, I also want to point out that 4666D, which is underlined, was our initial, our, our initial one. And when we add on the plant hosts, we also don't see any real structure in the phylogeny of the endophytes based on the plant hosts. So um, we also found a lot of viruses. So the viruses here are shown in alongside of the phylogeny and all the plants that are in red are plants that were thermal tolerant though so they grew they did very well in high temperatures the endophytes conferred this thermal tolerance and we found a second virus in fact now we have found a third virus um, they're all somewhat related but they're not identical so when we look at the phylogeny of the viruses we see these two viruses are are fairly distant, in fact. So this is, again, a maximum likelihood tree. This is using the amino acid sequences of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And you can see um, we also added a virus that we had discovered in Oklahoma. So it's in the same group here. And these are about 70% um, divergent. So that sounds like a lot if you're not used to looking at virus viruses. But actually, it does put them probably in the same family because viruses have a much more diversity than anything else. All right, so um, when we looked at the Curvularia thermal tolerance virus and, this, and the CV and we compared them, um, I should mention that we named the second virus Curvularia virus 2. That's why it says CV here. Very clever with our naming scheme. But anyway, um, when we look at these two phylogenies, then you can see a really good congruence between the trees. So all of the Curvularia pertuberata um, Came the, had the curvularia thermal tolerance virus, or I should say all the curvularia thermal tolerance virus came from curvularia protuberata, whereas all the curvularia virus 2 came from the other species of curvularia. Of course, there is an exception, however, and that is um, in each species of curvularia, we had one isolate that was actually infected with both viruses. So um, that's the only non-congruence in these two trees. So then we looked a little more carefully at curvularia thermal tolerance virus, and this is now looking at the nucleotide sequences, so we get better resolution in these. And here we see that there is significant geographic structure in the, um, in the viruses. So you can see that um, the ones from Amphitheater Springs group together, and the one, so from each location they group together. So this tells us that the viruses are not, probably not moving around in this larger area, although the fungi are. We have, again, an exception here, and that is the curvularia thermal tolerance virus that was found in the other species of curvularia. It's also on a different plant host. So it's probably been adapting to that new, um, that new host. So what we think is happening is um, shown in this cartoon here. So we think that the virus, so these hot spots, these geothermal features, act a bit like islands. So you have on the um, first panel, you have the uh, geothermal site, you have the plant, it's colonized with the fungus that's infected with the virus. Both the plant and the fungus can move, the seeds and spores both can be dispersed, so they are not actually in these geothermal soils. They can be in the cooler soils, and when they're in the cooler soil, we don't find viruses. So it means there's some cost for the virus, for having the virus, so that when you don't need it, it disappears. But if these fungi and or plants move again to a geothermal site, they have to reacquire the virus. And from our data, that's exactly what seems to be happening. So rather than carrying the viruses with them, they lose them and then they reacquire them. All right, so I want to move on now and tell you another story about an extreme environment. And we're going to talk about plant viruses here as mutualists. So we the start of this study, um, we were using a plant virus vector for silencing of drought-related genes in plants. So plant um, viruses have been used as a way to express other genes in their hosts for a long time. And we do that in plants as well as it's been done in animals and, and in human systems. Um, and so in this case, we were using a technique called silencing to look at drought, um, drought genes in plants. And so 
What you have here on the left is a plant that's infected with tobacco rattle virus, which was the vector that we used. And then on the right, you have the plant that's infected with tobacco rattle virus that's expressing part of a gene called BAG2. These genes had been described as being involved in stress tolerance. So indeed, um, I, it looks like they are. So what we did with this experiment was we just stopped watering the plants. It's a drought experiment. It's very easy to do. And I do it all the time in my house, unfortunately. I forget to water the plants, and then they go through this drought stress. But in this case, the bag, suppressing the BAG2 genes made this plants more sensitive to drought. So that was interesting. But what turned out to be more interesting was when we looked at the control. So these plants, now that are on your left, those plants have no virus at all. And they are doing much worse than anything else. So we didn't pursue looking at the BAG2 genes any further. And this was a few years ago. Since then, other people have looked at this and published it. But what we saw here, we thought, was much more interesting. We saw that having tobacco rattle virus in the plant made it very drought tolerant. These plants are a wild species of tobacco called Nicotiana benthamiana. They originate in Australia. And they are used by plant virologists a lot because they are kind of a universal host for plant viruses. So we decided to see um, what would happen with other viruses that we had in the lab. But this is just a small collection of viruses because we didn't work on a huge array of them. So this is brome mosaic virus in the first set of panels, cucumber mosaic virus, tobacco mosaic virus, and tobacco rattle virus. These are all um, on in the Cociana benthamiana, the wild tobacco, and we use that as a host because they all infect it. So what you have here are days after water withdrawal, and then you can see um, under the, the mock lane, those are uh, plants that are not infected with the virus, and then when they have the virus. And the appearance of drought symptoms, as well as the occurrence of, of the wilted shoot tip, are both delayed significantly whenever you have a virus infection. The uh, wilting of the shoot tip is especially important because when the shoot tip wilts, the plant probably will not be able to come back. Even if you water it, um, usually the plants don't survive that kind of stress. All right, so we found that all the viruses we had in the lab, at least, were um, able to confer this drought tolerance to plants. So then we looked at cucumber mosaic virus in a lot of different hosts because this virus has a very broad host range. So we looked at it in some hosts that you're probably familiar with, like beets and pepper, watermelon, cucumber, zucchini squash, tomato, et cetera. Um, the Solanum hapricides is a wild relative of tomato from South America. And again, in every case, when we have virus infection, we have a delay in the appearance of symptoms, and we also have a delay in the wilting of the shoot tip. So these are just a few days. This doesn't seem maybe like a huge amount of time, but if you're a farmer and you're waiting for it to rain, this could mean the difference between a crop or not having a crop. Here's some pictures of some of these plants. So on the left side, we have rice plants infected with bromosaic mosaic virus. And um, as the drought exper experiment continues, the plants without the virus become more and more stressed, whereas the plants that are virus infected don't really change a whole lot. And on the right panel, we have a plant called Kenopodium amaranticolor. And that's another, Kenopodium is another a genus of plants that are used a lot in plant virology too, because most um, viruses don't make a systemic infection in these plants. They only infect little spots on the inoculated leaf, and they don't move systemically. And that's the case here. So on the left, in that panel, you have the um, uninfected plants. And on the right, you have the CMV-infected plants. So even though the virus is not moving into the systemic tissue, it's still able to confer drought tolerance. And this is kind of um, an important also because Kenopodium, you might be more familiar with another species called Kenopodium quinoa. And the same thing actually happens in that plant. And Kenopodium quinoa is um, the plant that, that produces quinoa, a very popular grain. And growing that grain has become more problematic in South America, where it's, where it's a um, native, because of climate change. So climate change has changed the snowfall in the, in the Andes Mountains and the Altiplano region, where this is grown, has much less water. And so drought stress is, is a significant issue. 
Um, so it's possible that that farmers could use viruses to attenuate the problems that they're facing due to climate change. Another example of, of a plant virus conferring tolerance to stress is shown here. So these plants, these are red beet plants. The plants on the left, again, were not inoculated with virus, and the ones on the right were inoculated with virus. And what we did with these plants was we took them, we put them in a growth chamber, and we dropped the temperature below freezing at night. So during the day, they were under sort of normal temperatures, and then at night, it would drop down to below freezing. And what happened was the, the uh, uninfected plants all died, and the virus-infected plants actually did just fine. So this is also has some potential for practical applications because if the um, if you were to use if you had virus infected plants, you would be able to extend your growing season a little bit. So maybe at the beginning of the growing season when you might have a late um, frost, or in the end of the growing season when you might have an early frost at night, if you have virus infected plants. Um, you could extend that. So uh, I sometimes tell people, well, you should infect your garden plants with viruses and you'll have a better growing season. Um, but there are sometimes prices to be paid to, so that's not always such a great idea. Okay, so what do we know about plant viruses? Um, well, in fact, the first virus discovered and characterized was tobacco mosaic virus in 1898. It was the first virus. Um, and most plant viruses, like viruses of everything, have been largely described and characterized because they cause disease. So when, one of the other projects in my lab has been to look at viruses in wild plants. And until recently, um, these things were only looked at in weeds surrounding crops. Um, but virus discovery has really been aided by next generation sequencing. We're able to obtain huge amounts of data now. Um, we're still challenged with the bioinformatics of sorting all that out. But nevertheless, um, we've been able to look at plant viruses from many different environments, um, including they've been looked at in human and animal guts. So you eat plants, so you have a lot of plant viruses in your gut. Um, they're also found in water sources, within insects, um, including mosquitoes. So we think of mosquitoes as feeding on mammals, but in fact, the male mosquitoes predominantly feed on plants. So this is, um, we did two studies in my lab on the biodiversity of plant viruses. One was in the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve in Oklahoma, and, the, and that's an area that's managed by the Nature Conservancy. And the other was in the Area Conservation Guanacaste, which is in um, northwestern Costa Rica. So the site in, in Costa Rica is very diverse. There are many different um, habitats. There are many different ecological zones. And there are a, a huge amount of biodiversity of the host. And in fact, um, it, is a, it is a biodiversity hotspot. So about almost 3% of all the world's species live in this very small area, which is less than, smaller than the average county in the United States. So there's a lot of diversity. This is dry forest, which is deciduous in the dry season. Um, there is primary dry forest here, some of the only primary dry forest left. It goes up into cloud forests. Um, unfortunately, because of climate change, cloud forests are becoming very rare. There are also geothermal areas here. And there, are, um, there is Atlantic rainforest or Caribbean rainforest where you have these enormous trees. In the tall grass prairie, we have a single ecosystem, grass, essentially. There are a few areas of um, trees in between, but it's essentially one ecosystem. It's managed by the Nature Conservancy by bison grazing. So um, these inventories, we call them ecogenomic studies, and I'll tell you why in a minute. We isolate total nucleic acid from individual plants, and this is different than most metagenomic type of studies, because most metagenomic studies take everything in a single environment. And we're taking individuals here. So it does make a difference. It makes it a lot more work. Um, but it also gives us a, lot, a very different kind of data. So we take these, um, we isolate these total nucleic acids, and then we enrich for double-stranded RNA. And that is a hallmark of RNA virus infection. And so we are only looking at RNA viruses in these studies. Um, this is converted to cDNA. We multiplex it. We sequence it. We assemble it, and then we match it to its nearest relative by uh, blast searches. 
And most of what we find is new. So we can classify it by family if it's, got an, if it's related to a virus family. Um, but about 60% of what we, have, we find doesn't have any sim, uh, similarity to any known virus family. Um, we have now analyzed uh, or partially analyzed about 9,000 individual plants in these studies. And this is a summary of the virus families we have found in these plants. Um, and this, uh, this is a lim not including the 60% that don't have any hits. Um, and so what you can see here, um, you probably, this probably won't have a lot of meaning to you, but what I want to point out is that a number of these families are what are known as persistent viruses. So they're shown this way. Um, and so you can see that over half of these are actually pers these, in these persistent virus families. This is a very different picture than what's recognized in the International Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses because they only list about 24 different species. So there's a few more now. Quite recently, they've added a few more. But still, the majority of viruses that are described by this group are acute plant viruses, not persistent viruses. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means in a second here. All right, so in the wild plants, many can be binned into existing virus families, as I said, but not into existing genera or species. Um, and the majority are persistent. We have not seen any that are causing any apparent disease. So persistent viruses um, are probably not the viruses you've heard about. Acute plant viruses, they initiate an infection. They replicate usually quite rapidly. They may reach a very high titer. They often cause disease or death. And they are always resolved either by recovery of the plant or by death or occasionally conversion to chronic infections. But chronic infections in plants are not so common. Persistent viruses actually infect the host for very long periods of time, probably many generations, and they are passed along vertically. So there are several families of plant viruses that are persistent, or sometimes they're called cryptic, um, but they're not really so hidden, so I prefer not to use that term. They have been very poorly studied. In general, they are asymptomatic. Perhaps that's one reason they haven't been studied very much. They're not thought to be transmitted horizontally, only vertically. And they don't move between plant cells. They just are moving only by cell division. So there are, these are the families of viruses and plants that are persistent. The top family is the Endornaviridae. Um, Todiviridae has not really been officially recognized <coughs> as a plant virus. The Chrysoviridae recently described the Amalgaviridae and the Partiviridae. So most likely, we think persistent viruses are mutualistic. Why do we think that? Well, they've had this very long association with their hosts. They're vertically transmitted. And at least one case, we know they can provide an important functional gene for a plant. Um, and that is white clover cryptic virus. That virus can control nodulation of the, of the plant. So clover is a legume. It normally forms these nodules in a symbiotic relationship with rhizobacterium. And um, they fix nitrogen, but that's a costly thing for them to do. So if there's enough nitrogen in the soil, the virus can suppress the formation of these nodules. And that was they were able to move this gene into another plant and show that it does the same thing. We also know from work in my lab and others that bell pepper and donavirus and pepper cryptic virus both increase the germination rates of, of peppers. Um, so in the tall grass prairie, we, of 220 wild plants that were carrying the Partiti virus, only six of those were co-infected with an acute virus. Um, and given the incidence of acute viruses, we would have expected many more, six times as many of the Partiti virus infected plants to be co-infected. And so we are, we are currently in my lab, we are asking the question, do Partiti viruses protect plants from acute virus infection? And we know in the laboratory that we have no problem infecting plants that have Partiti viruses with other acute viruses. That's, they are very easy to infect. But we think it might have something to do instead with their interactions with the vectors of plant viruses or insect effects. So insects are very important in transmitting viruses in plants. And it turns out from quite um, interesting recent work it's been shown that when a virus infects a plant, it, it affects the volatiles that the plant produces. So it can actually 
increase the attraction of insects to the plant. And it can also produce anti-feeding compounds. So once the insect has arrived at the plant, starts feeding on it, it can produce a compound that makes the insect move off. So it enhances its own transmission this way. So I'd like to um, wind up, and we're going to have plenty of time, I think, for questions. Um, so plant and fungal viruses um, can help plants cope with extreme environments. And this could be a really critical thing um, for feeding the world in our changing climate. So it's something we really need to take into consideration. And virus biodiversity studies have shown that plant viruses are abundant, and most of them are asymptomatic. So, and persistent viruses in plants are widespread, and they may have very important but as yet undiscovered functions in plants. One of the things I also want to mention about persistent viruses here is that they are very, very common in crop plants. If you eat peppers, you eat persistent viruses all the time, um, but they're also very common in many other plants. And um, it's interesting that during the domestication of plants, they were selected for these, they selected for plants that carried these persistent viruses. So it makes me think that there was something, they conferred a trait to the plant that was desirable for this domestication process. So these are the kind of things that we are now exploring in the lab to try to understand what's going on. So I want to leave you with some images. This is a picture in Costa Rica where we've done these biodiversity studies. And you can see a very beautiful, lush scene here with lots of plants. Um, and they all look really healthy. In fact, in the wild plants, we have not seen anything that we could attribute to viruses, any kind of disease. If you go a few kilometers away from here to crop plants, and here we have on the upper panel, we have um, pineapple. And on the lower panel, we have oranges. And they look pretty diseased and unhappy. So what's the difference between these? Well, in, the, in the agriculture, people have spent lots of time and effort keeping all the microbes out. So that means bacteria, fungi, and, and viruses. Viruses are usually kept out by spraying for insects or by roguing plants that show symptoms. So these plants are probably pretty microbe free, and they don't look so good. They do have some microbes. They probably have some pathogenic microbes. But in fact, their beneficial microbes could perhaps help them. Um, it, the, another difference that's important between this scene in the wild and this scene of agriculture is that in agriculture, we generally grow things in a monoculture. That can also have an impact on the dynamics of disease. So this kind of a scenario is not unique to Costa Rica. This is also found in a, um, places like Africa. This is a picture in a wild area in Cote d'Ivoire. And at the very edge of this area is a field of cassava, which is devastated by cassava mosaic virus. So I'm going to um, end it there. And I just want to acknowledge my own mutualistic network, um, my labs at Penn State and the Noble Foundation, uh, the Oklahoma Plant Virus Biodiversity Working Group, and also Rusty Rodriguez and Regina Redman, who are mycologists that I've worked with over the years, and also Joan Henson. And then I also want to acknowledge um, Felipe Chavarria and my lab in Costa Rica, who did a lot of the work isolating the double-stranded RNA out of these wild plants. And I want to acknowledge the funding agencies. And before uh, we start questions, I just have a couple of other things. Um, one, I want to mention that I've just published a book on viruses. And, and um, this is available now on Amazon. And I think you're going to see a URL where you can connect to it. So if you're interested in learning more about viruses, this is a really fun book. And it's kind of a coffee table book. It's just got a lot of pictures in it. It's very simple. Um, you can, anyone can read it and understand it. And um, I will leave you with a final image um, of this is an insect in Costa Rica, a praying mantis. And it's mimicking a plant. So the back of this insect looks like a plant. But what's really interesting to me is that the, it's also mimicking a plant with symptoms of virus infection. So those yellow spots are pretty common symptoms that you might see in a virus infection. So perhaps this says that symptomatic viruses have been with us for a long time. And with that, I am ready to take questions.
Marilyn, thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, for our first question, Marilyn. Based on these traditional definitions, how would you classify human non-LTR retrotransposins? Very virocentric. So Very I, virocentric. I would classify them as um, as viruses or ancient viruses that are and they, that were perhaps active viruses at one time and now are just active in a different way in the genome. But I think they probably originated as viruses. Next question. Are plant pathologists engaged in viral transfection to produce mutualistic environment for hardiness? Not there's not a lot of there's not a lot of work being done right now with that, although there are a couple of companies um, that I'm aware of, one in Seattle, Washington called uh, applied symbiotic technologies, or perhaps it's advanced symbiotic technologies, that's, they're trying to use microbes in, in a beneficial way for agriculture. And then there's a company in Boston called Indigo, which is also doing some similar things. So there is interest in using microbes and including viruses, although viruses have not been explored as much as bacteria and fungi for these purposes. So I think it's an important area for people to look into. There is a stigma about viruses, and I think that in order to be successful with these kind of um, in inquiries, we have to get past the stigma a bit. One of the reasons I wrote this book, so um, I think that it's important to, you know, open our minds up. So it, there, about 10 years ago, people thought all bacteria were dangerous and bad and pathogens, and now people are recognizing, I mean, even I think almost anybody will recognize that there are lots of beneficial microbes and bacteria in our guts and we need them to survive. And I think that's true of viruses too. So um, as far as using viruses in agriculture hasn't been done very much yet. <clears throat> I will say that there is, there has been some work done on using viruses as biocontrol agents in agriculture, in plants and in animals. So viruses that in fact um, bacteria, for example, that are pathogens of bacteria are being deployed to, um, to get rid of uh, bacterial pathogens in plants. Yeah. Next question. Why look only for dsRNA? Many plant viruses are ssRNA virus. Yeah, that's true. But in fact, when you look at double-stranded RNA, um, you can find the single-stranded RNA viruses too. So most single-stranded RNA viruses make um, both strands during their replication process. And in fact, we found a lot of single-stranded RNA viruses in these studies. So they are detected as well. The only ones that you don't detect very well are minus-strand RNA viruses. And we saw some of those, but not very many. So the reason for using this method is because um, it gets rid of an awfully lot of the background that you would get if you tried to sequence all the RNA. There are other methods for doing these kind of studies, um, and the different people use different methods. I think they all have drawbacks, and they all have advantages. So it just depends on what you're looking for. How do you think the various types of transposin-based elements in plants impact the health of plants? Uh, 
Well, I can't claim to be an expert on transposons, but there are in indeed a lot of transposons in plants. Um, and they do things like they can affect gene expression. I guess the most famous ones are um, in corn that affect the color variation. Um, and there are some retro elements. I wouldn't call them retro transposons because they don't probably don't jump around anymore. But there are retro elements in some plants that can confer um, resistance to related viruses. So um, particularly the retroviruses in plants, some of them confer um, resistance to related viruses. Other ones don't. And there are some retroviruses that can jump back out of the genome and become infectious viruses too. But transposons themselves, um, I don't really know. They're a very big part of the of the plant genome, but not just the plant genome, actually. They're in other things, too. Now, Marilyn, are there any beneficial viruses in humans? Yes, there are. In fact, there are quite a few. And um, there are other labs that have worked on these. So I'm not an expert in these, but um, there are. For example, I know that in mice, there are um, herpes viruses that are quite similar to herpes viruses that humans can carry. And these actually protect against some um, bacterial infections, like the bubonic plague, for example. Um, Listeria, which is a bacterial disease that you can get from dairy products. Um, so yes, there are beneficial viruses in humans. And I think that um, that's another area that hasn't been very thoroughly explored, but there are quite a few. And the, and the other, a lot of these studies, of course, are done in mice. We don't do experiments in humans. Um, another, a really interesting potentially beneficial virus in the gut is um, noroviruses. So noroviruses are f kind of famous because some of them cause a real gastrointestinal distress, like um, what you get on, what I think it's sometimes it's called cruise ship virus, the virus that causes food poisoning. Um, but there are other noroviruses in mice that can actually rebuild the gut architecture in a sterile mouse. So the architecture of the gut is very important in the immune response. And this is, we've known for a long time, that well, for quite a while now, they've known that this architecture is at least in part, built by the bacteria that live in the gut. But if you have a sterile mouse, which you can have, sterile mice can be um, created by either they're um, born and kept sterile, or sometimes you just treat them with antibiotics and get rid of all of their gut microbes. And if you have a mouse like that, and you feed it a norovirus, it rebuilds that architecture that's so critical for the immune system. So perhaps the viruses can actually replace the bacteria in the gut for some of these same kind of functions. So there are quite a few more. There have been um, some recent reviews. I actually wrote one myself, but I'm not trying to advertise too much. But I wrote a review last year in the Journal of Virology, which was called Move Over Bacteria, Viruses Make Their Mark as Beneficial Microbes. So that outlines some of these examples as well. Thanks. Why has there been such an overwhelming emphasis on disease-causing viruses? Well, um, I'm not sure, but there could be lots of explanations. So one thing is, the first virus that was discovered was causing disease in plants, tobacco plants, tobacco mosaic virus. Um, and so perhaps that set the stage for disease-causing viruses. I also sometimes think that humans are obsessed with bad news. If you turn on the news, you rarely hear any good news. So perhaps we're also obsessed with bad viruses. So that's another reason. And I guess finally I would say that perhaps, I mean, we do know that, that viruses can cause very devastating diseases. And so people have been concerned about that just for health risks health issues, not only in humans, but in their domestic plants and animals, and sometimes in wildlife, too. So I guess there's a reason for that bias, but I think it's important to realize 
that those disease-causing viruses are not the normal viruses. They're the probably the exceptional viruses. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. We don't have any more time for questions. So I would like to once again thank Dr. Marilyn Rusink for her presentation. Marilyn, do you have any final comments for our audience? And, you know, if you're interested in viruses, enjoy them. They're a lot of fun and they're amazing little microbes and they can do a lot of amazing things. So um, if you're a young person getting into research, there's a lot of room to do research in this area. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Thank you again, Marilyn. I want to remind our audience that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 8, 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Goodbye.